Hello, everyone. It's Lionel Sander from Pembroke Publishers, and thanks for joining us this evening or this afternoon, depending where you are in the country. <laughs> uh, it's the uh, right at the very end of the school year. So just before we got started, uh, uh, both Amanda and I were saying that anyone that's joining us today deserves, uh, I guess, a double gold star for uh, for professionalism and attending. So thank you very much mm -hmm. for uh, for joining us this evening. And now it's my uh, my pleasure to introduce our presenter for this evening. Uh, if you've uh, if you've been joining us for previous Pembroke Publishers, you uh, you might recognize her as uh, this is her third time with us this year, and so we thank her for taking time to to share her expertise in a variety of areas. But uh, it, it's nice to have you back. Uh, and for those of you that don't know who I'm talking about, this is uh, Amanda Ewall, who's uh, based in Toronto. And uh, the very first time I introduced you, Amanda, I said, I think you were living part of my dream of being able to teach all over in different <laughs> parts of the world uh, as an elementary and junior high school teacher in, uh, yeah. in Japan and Canada for just a couple of places. Uh, one of her books is on uh, specializing in substitute, uh, uh, substitute in teacher, uh, specializing in teacher training um, with a little uh, focus on substitute teaching, which won the 20. 17 Writers Award from the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario. I'm uh, going to cost to talk about her new book, uh, What's the Difference? Building on Autism Strength, Skills, and Talents in Your Classroom. A, uh, an issue that is big in all of uh, all provinces, but especially now in Ontario. So Amanda, welcome. It's great to have you here, and I'll pass the uh, virtual mic over to you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I did want to say thank you so much for coming when school is almost done. I really appreciate you guys coming out. Um, so this year I've been teaching grade five online. My class was online all year and I have one autistic student and he um, is very detail oriented. And so he always lets me know when it's almost time to go for recess or lunch or the end of the day. He makes sure I know, you know, Miss Ewell, two more minutes. So he's my timekeeper this year. Also, probably about maybe two thirds of the way through the school year, he started saying what I always say just before I was going to say it. So before I let the students go for lunch or recess, I usually say, if you have any questions, you can stay and ask them, but otherwise you can go. And so I would say, okay, if, and he would say, if you have any questions, you can stay and ask them, but otherwise you can go, bye. And so he started taking over my lines and um, I, I send the students to breakout rooms for various things. And when they come back, they have a minute to come back. So some students come back right away. And then other students, they take the full minute to come back. And so when everyone comes back at the end of the minute, I would say, here they come. And so I would say, here. And he would say, here they come. And so <laughs> he's very, very detail-oriented. And I was so pleased that he started making friends outside of the virtual classroom with the other students about halfway through the year. They would meet um, on uh, Google Hangouts and play video games together. And he actually has done so well this year online, really so much better than his parents or I were expecting. And he's really thrived quite a lot. And so it's really fun because not only is he detail oriented, but also I get to hear what I always say because he just repeats it back to everyone. <laughs> so that's uh, this year, the autistic student I have in my class. Um, as you can see here, there's lots of places to contact me anytime. Please, you know, email me, uh, Amanda at AmandaYule.com. If you have questions anytime, contact me on any of the platforms. That would be great. So I want to talk a little bit about why I say autistic students and not um, students with autism. So in education, we have traditionally said students with autism. But as I was doing um, research and as I was talking with uh, autistic adults, I found out that in the autistic community, they prefer to be called autistic, so autistic students, and not with autism. The reason is they think that with autism, Autism sounds like they have a disease. And they're very clear, autism is not a disease. And also, um, 
they feel that autism is part of their um, personality, part of their identity. And so they want to be called autistic. So I have changed from saying with autism to saying autistic students. Now I'm still learning. So you might find me catching up. You know, I might make a mistake here and there. But um, you'll find throughout this presentation and throughout the book, I say autistic students or autistic people trying to honor what I have found to be the preferred terminology in the autistic community. Um, so I want to talk a bit about the changing paradigm around autism. We're sort of halfway through a paradigm shift in education. And um, we know that it's sort of here and there's more coming. And so I just want to clearly lay it out. So we're clear um, how it goes. Sort of, And there's two kind of areas. The first is it used to be when I first started teaching, uh, there were no autistic students in my classes. So that was like 23, 24 years ago. Uh, they were all in their own autistic classes. And uh, in my class, there were mostly uh, students, like no students with autism. But now I teach in Southeast Scarborough, which is a uh, part of Toronto that's sort of on the lower uh, income scale. I usually have one or two autistic students in my class every year, and most teachers have one or two autistic students. Um, and that is going only to increase with the changes in legislation in Ontario. We will see more and more autistic students uh, in the mainstream classes. And so uh, this, is, um, this is also, uh, changing how we teach. So I want to talk a little bit about how do we teach then, right? So that it's not so difficult. Um, the second sort of changing paradigm is that we used to consider autism a disease or a disability and is still listed as a disability. However, the autistic community has been speaking out and saying, this is not a disease. This is a different way of being. So when I started teaching, the definition of normal was a very narrow definition. And the changing paradigm is the definition of normal is widening to include more and more people as we become a more and more inclusive society. Right. So uh, what's happening is um, a very famous a lady with autism called uh, Temple Grandin. She uh, is a very famous speaker for autistic people and also in uh, animal behaviorism. I think she has a double PhD in both of those areas. And she says that if she could you know, snap her fingers and change from um, for, like to not be autistic at all, she wouldn't do it because she would lose part of who she is. And part of who she is is really needed by our society. Um, she says that, you know, a little bit of autism is good for creative people. And truthfully, um, maybe we can think of people who are creative, who we think, oh, maybe they are a little bit autistic. And uh, truthfully, autistic people have brought so much to our society. And so the paradigm is changing where we're starting to acknowledge autism is not only a weakness, it is also a strength, right? So, and we're including uh, more things in normal, right, in our definition of normal. So that's the changing paradigm. And we're sort of partway through this paradigm shift in education. So I just want to make it clear so we can sort of see where that's going. Uh, so when we know we're going to have autistic students in our class, we can prepare for that. And there's lots of ways to prepare for that. And um, the first thing that we're going to do is prepare our physical classroom. And many autistic people have um, very sensitive uh, sensory systems. So they have extraordinary sensory perception, which means the lights are too bright for them, the sounds are too loud, that sort of thing. And so the, when I was, you know, uh, in teacher's college and I was in the elementary panel, they taught us, you know, your classroom should be colorful with lots of things on the walls, you know, lots of ways for the students to learn. Um, and so you can see the first picture on my slide here has lots of things on the wall, right? And that's typically what my classroom would look like. 
However, this can be really overwhelming for our autistic students and all for, also for our students with ADHD and you know other students as well. And so you can see the other slide has a classroom with less wall covering, but it's still a classroom and uh, still very, very functional. And so when we're preparing our classrooms for our students, we wanna make sure, oh yeah, like we have, um, we, we have not so, um, so many things on the wall, right? And uh, I wanted to mention too, this tonight, my goal is to give you a whole bunch of strategies. So obviously, you guys already have your own strategies. You've probably taught autistic students, you have your own strategies. But I know we all come to times where we've tried maybe seven or eight strategies with a student, and it just hasn't worked. So tonight, my goal is to give as many strategies I can in about 45 minutes and leave some room for questions. Uh, and that's also in the book. There's just lots of lots of strategies because of course every student's an individual and you know what works for the student may not work for that student and so the goal is lots of strategies and when you look through the book at the end of all my chapters I have a checklist of all the strategies I've mentioned in that chapter so if you know um, you've been trying strategies with a student say you're trying to help their communication you can go to the chapter on communication, go to the checklist. You know, you've tried, say, four or five strategies. There's going to be 30 more strategies on that checklist. And you can pick out one or two that you think might work and try it with your student. So that's the goal, right? Obviously, none of us have all the answers or we'd be, you know, very rich. Uh, but we do, we do. Um, you know, have some of the answers and that's the goal to find more of the answers. Also, at the end of each chapter is a lesson plan. So, um, the, for example, preparing for autistic students, the lesson plan in that chapter is on introducing autism to your class and uh, when to do that and how to include your student or not include your student as the case may be. Right? So this is sort of what I'm hoping tonight. So when we're going to prepare our physical classroom, we're going to look to not overload the senses of our autistic students. Obviously, we're going to do a lot more, but that's one of the main things that we can do. The next thing we're going to do to prepare for our autistic students is we're going to talk with the parents. So if we know, like sometimes we know the year ahead that uh, we're going to have an autistic student in our class and we can go talk with the parents even the year before. But if not the first week of school, you know, as soon as we can, because the parents are the experts. I don't know if you've ever spoken with parents of autistic children. They sound like doctors. They have so much lingo going on because autism has its own vocabulary, right? And, you know, they have so much lingo going on and, you know, they know um, they've been to this community center and over here there's a resource they're using and, you know, they just, they have a lot of information. And so when we talk with them, we can get, you know, lots of information about what might work with their student, with their child, what might not work with them. Um, and we want to work with them as partners because it's just easier. And I have to tell you, you probably already know this, parents of autistic children have been blamed for their child's behavior all of their child's life. And they're tired of it. And my friend who has an autistic boy says, she has three boys and the middle one's autistic. And she says, do you think I parented him any differently from the other two? I did not. <laughs> you know, so um, we want to be part of the solution for these parents, not part of the problem. And let's say, even if we know for sure they are the problem, it still doesn't help to uh, treat them as the problem. It's still as much better to try to get them on our side. So we are going to try our best to work with parents, to let them know that we want to work together, to get information from them. Do you know, I've had parents who've said to me, I will give you my new phone number, but don't give it to the office, you know, because they're just, they're tired of the phone calls. And we want to be the teacher that has the phone number in case of emergency, right? I'm always like, thank you so much. In case of emergency, I will call this number. <laughs> so we want to, you know, as much as possible, let them know that we want to work with them, that, uh, you know, we understand that it can be difficult. And even sometimes I have a different philosophy than the parents, and that's okay. Like, I don't always agree with them. 
And I still let them know that we want to try and find a solution that works for their child the best. So I highly recommend, you know, talking with the parents, getting them on your side at the beginning. That might avoid a year of, you know, many, many emails. <laughs> long, long emails, right? We want, we want a good relationship with them. So obviously there's many, many more things we can do to prepare for our autistic students, but these are some of the main ones. Okay, as I was talking with um, autistic friends and friends of friends and educators and teachers in preparation and research for writing this book, I heard this phrase all the time. When you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person, right? And the point there is that we don't want to stereotype. Yes, we often hear about using visual schedules with autistic students. And not all autistic students need them or want them or um, want them forced on them, right? So for those of you who may not know, a visual schedule is where on your board you have your schedule for the day and beside each time you have the period written and then a picture of what you're doing. So beside phys ed, there's a picture of phys ed. And the reason we do that is many autistic students are visual thinkers. So in their mind, their thoughts are pictures and then they have to translate it into words to speak with us. And so the uh, visual schedule, they don't have to translate the words on the board into pictures. They can just look at the picture and know right away what's next. Also, Oftentimes it helps reduce anxiety to know what's coming next, how much more time they have, right? But just like we as teachers don't want to be stereotyped as people who always wear Christmas sweaters at Christmas and Halloween sweaters at Halloween, although some teachers do wear Christmas sweaters at Christmas and Halloween sweaters at Halloween, and that's okay, but we just don't want to be stereotyped, right? The same with autistic people. They don't want to be stereotyped. And so obviously this is a bit of a catch-22 because as teachers, we do need strategies. So we are tonight looking at generalities and some things you may commonly encounter with autistic students. And we also don't want to forget each autistic student is an individual person. And as teachers, we're going to get to know them, just like I got to know my autistic student this year and how he is my timekeeper. <laughs> very, very handy. <laughs> uh, the next thing we want to get to know about our autistic students is their extraordinary sensory perception. 80 to 90 percent of autistic people have extraordinary sensory perception that uh, hinders their day-to-day -day life. So the lights are too bright, the noises are too loud, the smells are too much, or they really like a smell that most people don't like. You know, they uh, really like the feel of something. One of um, what a student who used to be in the class beside me, uh, he carried around a little jar, a margarine jar of um, rice, and he would just run his hands through the rice all the time. So that helped him be calm. He really liked it. And it reminded me of my grandmother, because when you open my grandmother's fridge and she had margarine containers, it was never margarine. You know, there were meatballs and there might be rice in one of her margarine containers. So whenever I saw him, I always smiled and thought about my grandmother. <laughs> so as we get to know our autistic students, we can get to know, do they have extraordinary sensory perception? Do we need to make sure that the lights are dimmed in our classroom? Do we need to provide um, headphones that uh, reduce the sound, right? Do we need to get one of those nose plugs from the swimming section of the sports store so that they can't smell you know, whatever smells are going on in our intermediate classroom, you know, those intermediate smells. <laughs> so um, as we get to know them, we can know how to help them the best. And then we also want to get to know um, more than their extraordinary sensory perception. Many autistic students have a secondary um, diagnosis. Many, many autistic students also have epilepsy, which means we can't have flashing lights in our classroom, or there might be certain things that set off a seizure. Um, so as we get to know our students, you know, that's really important. We go to their student record, we read it and see, do they have secondary diagnosis? Are they gifted? Do they have ADHD? Is there anxiety? Is there OCD? Right? This part of getting to know our students, and so it can help us as we teach know what to do. 
Uh, and I want to say, you know, one of the paradigm shifts that's going on right now in education is we're sort of moving towards a universal design for learning, which means that we used to teach our average students and then we had, and we taught sort of to the average student. And then we had enrichment activities for the students who um, could do, uh, you know, the, the average things were kind of easy for them. And then we had sort of other sheets to help our students who had difficulty understanding to help them catch up to the average student. And we taught to the average student. But now what we're doing is we're trying to teach to all students. So for example, um, if it's winter, in Canada, it seems like it's winter a lot, um, you know, and uh, we're outside and nothing's been shoveled and we call the caretaker, we may ask them to shovel the ramp first before the stairs because one of our students is in a wheelchair and they can use the ramp and so can everyone else use the ramp to get in. But if we shovel the stairs first, then everyone except for one student can get in the school. So in our classrooms, maybe we just keep our lights dimmed um, because there's enough light for the other students and our autistic student is also able to work. Right? So we're sort of trying to, instead of teaching the average student and then having extra things for our autistic students, we want to teach so that our autistic students are included in the average students. Right? So, for example, they might be overstimulated. We've talked about that a lot, right? Where there's just too many colors, too much movement going on, and we just need to decrease the stimulation, right? Perhaps asking students to talk quieter or perhaps talking quieter ourselves. I tend to be like that loud joking teacher, and uh, sometimes students who are quieter um, don't warm up to me very quickly because I'm quite loud. <laughs> and so I have to remind myself, speak calmly, speak a little bit slower, you know, and um, do it for the whole day and not just the five minutes you're thinking about it. That's a challenge for me. And it really helps some of my students. But there's another thing that we don't hear about too much. Sometimes our students can be understimulated. So let's say we have a student who's up on their desk jumping and yelling, and we might think, oh, it's overstimulation. They need less noise, less lights. But it could also be that they need more sensory stimulation. And so maybe they need to wear a weighted vest or put a weighted blanket around them. Or if we don't have that, we can just put some heavy books in their backpack and have them carry the backpack around. And maybe it's the end of the day and they help us carry it to our car. You know, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> we do want to give them some heavy work to do. Like we've tried decreasing the stimulation. It didn't work. We can try increasing the stimulation. Some autistic students don't have that thing in their inner ear that makes you dizzy. And they can spin around without getting dizzy. And so it might be they just need to spin around like for a minute or two, and that will give them the sensory stimulation they need to calm down, to lessen their agitation. Uh, one of my uh, teachers that I worked with, he used to uh, have a little trampoline in his room and the kids could just jump on it whenever they wanted. And I used to tease him that, yeah, the trampoline was for his students. <laughs> you know, um, But there's lots of ways we can increase the sensory stimulation. They can just push their hands together as tight as they can and really focus on it, right? So we might want to keep that in mind as well. Okay, schoolwork. Sometimes we have trouble getting our students to do schoolwork. Um, and that's not only our autistic students. So what can we do to help our students do schoolwork? They have so many great evasive techniques, don't they? And I'm going to tell you the best evasive technique I've ever come across. Um, this is probably like 10, 15 years ago now. Um, I taught beside a developmentally delayed class and uh, the um, the, there's a few autistic students in that class and one of them, when he didn't want to do work, would start taking off his clothes. It was the most effective strategy I've ever seen. As soon as he started taking off his clothes, everyone stopped trying to get him to do work and started trying to get him to put his clothes back on. <laughs> and I was like, okay, <laughs> this is so effective, you know, but we needed to help him learn how to 
be calm because it was his anxiety. He was worried he couldn't do the work, right? Every student's different. So when we helped him be calm and gave him work that he knew he could do, then he wouldn't be so resistant to doing work. Um, that same student, he would sometimes run outside the school without his clothes on. And we were on a busy street. I'm amazed there were not more accidents on that road. And the principal would be yelling at him, put your clothes on and get inside. And uh, it, it, the student wouldn't listen to him. And so he would go and get the student's teacher. And she came out, I remember the first time she came out, she's like, there are mosquitoes out here. The mosquitoes are going to bite you like all over. And he was like, oh, mosquitoes, mosquitoes. And he put his clothes back on and went inside. <laughs> and after that, the teacher could do no wrong in the principal's eyes. So hopefully we won't have that extreme uh, circumstance, but we do want to help our students do schoolwork. <laughs> so um, many, many people I spoke with, many educators I spoke with, especially EAs who work mostly with autistic students told me, every autistic student, it, you have to find how to unlock their walls. It's like, especially the younger ones, it's like they're um, locked in behind these walls and you have to find what will open up the walls and help them do their work. And so it's kind of like you're like a detective. You're finding out, you know, is it that they like, you know, the very little children, do they like SpongeBob? And if you put SpongeBob stickers on all their work, they'll do it because there's SpongeBob there. Is it um, the older students really like computers? And if you put all their work on the computer, they'll do it. Like, what is it that helps them, you know, uh, unlocks the walls to learning? So we're sort of like a detective. And one of the ways to unlock their walls is to use strengths. Did you know that until about five years ago, all of the research on autism was focused on weaknesses? And this one um, autistic researcher realized that there were absolutely no studies on autistic strengths. And she did the first ever study on autistic strengths. Isn't that crazy? That was five years ago. And of course, we know that autistic people, they're often very detail-oriented. They have a good memory, and they will tell you what you said um, last week. Miss Ewell, you said we could have a movie next week. Remember, Miss Ewell? <laughs> oh, yes, I remember, even though I had actually forgot. <laughs> right? Or um, a lot of them think in pictures and are very good at um, knowing how things will fit together, you know, like there's just, there's lots of strengths. And so when we use our autistic students' strengths, that can really help them to want to learn. So another student I worked with, um, he was very good at math and he could tell you what day of the week your birthday was on any year, as long as you didn't lie about how old you were. <laughs> So um, he would see me outside on, your, on yard duty. He would say, Miss Ewell, when's your birthday? And I would say, you know when my birthday is, because whenever you told him his birthday, he remembered it from then on. He had everyone in the school's birthday memorized. And he would say, this year, your birthday's on a Saturday. And I would say, yes, that's right. And so we would use that in our lessons. He, used, he wasn't in my class, but he came to my class to read with my students. I had grade one, two that year. And um, he would come in, and we would use his memory. And uh, he really started to, when the kids understood his strength, and they would ask him questions, and it would make him feel good. And he really started to open up and read uh, more comfortably and uh, more confidently to my students students, it was really great. And so we want to find out their strength and we want to use it because of course everyone has strengths. And the last thing I wanted to say about virtual, about schoolwork was virtual learning. We can hardly, hardly have a webinar this year and not mention virtual learning, can we? Because uh, we've all been doing virtual learning, whether you were online all year, like I was, um, or whether you had a class that was partly in the school and partly online. So um, many autistic students are really bothered by the glitches in technology. So when, um, when you're delayed a bit, when things take a long time to load, when um, you, know, you glitch a bit and then it speeds up, that really bothers them. And so when the uh, 
school is handing out computers for students to use, I try to make sure that my autistic students get the newer computers. <laughs> and I let people, I let, you know, the person in charge of computers know that that's what I'm going to do uh, because it helps them learn, whereas other students, that won't bother them so much. Also, I also I often recommend to the uh, parents that they don't use Wi-Fi, that they actually plug it in with the landline right directly to the uh, modem because there's less glitching that way as well. And if the parents are providing the computer, I just recommend they get the best computer they can afford. Also, uh, sometimes autistic students can be um, distracted by their own video. And so it's okay if they don't want to use the video um, if they have it turned off, I say, yeah, that's totally, totally fine. Um, so we just want to make sure that we're accommodating our autistic students and giving them the absolute best, um, you know, opportunity to learn and do their schoolwork. Okay, so um, one of the things that we want to help our autistic students with is emotional regulation. Uh, just like many of us, we sometimes have trouble with emotional regulation and we want to make sure that we can help them um, learn how to regulate their emotions. Um, and so uh, one of the more commonly known programs for this is the zones of regulation, um, especially for the younger guys, but I've used it up to grade six. and. Um, it's so great. It's just zones of regulation. You can find it online. And it just goes through like how the students are feeling, recognizing how we're feeling, what to do when we're not feeling like we're doing very well. One of the keys is we want to recognize triggers, right? So sometimes there's something that will trigger our students and sets them off just they're so upset. And once, you know, once it escalates, you know, they're not really in control of their emotions, you know, or they don't really have self-control and we want them to have that, right? So we're going to look for ways to understand the triggers and then to de-escalate, right? So we might notice that um, they're often triggered um, coming back in from recess. They have a really hard time transitioning from recess into doing our work. Right? And so maybe we decide, okay, instead of going right from recess to work, we're going to do recess, a game in the class, and then work. Right? So we're going to sort of recognize those triggers. The other thing is we want to recognize our own triggers. Sometimes something that they do really bothers us, you know, um, like they can really get maybe like when they swear at us, that really bothers us. Or maybe when they, you know, are really bothered, like um, bullying other students, that really bothers us. And we want to make sure that we know our own triggers as well, right? Because once our students know our triggers, if they want to make us mad, they just do that thing that triggers us, right? So we want to make sure that we are, you know, using our best inner actress to not yell when they kick us or spit on us. And we are using our best inner actress to be calm when they throw the computer and to maintain our calm because we don't want to escalate the situation, right? We want to de-escalate it. I don't know about you, but when I need to de-escalate, I use chocolate. Like chocolate is such a great de-escalation technique. Not, I mean, not for the students. I can't give them chocolate, especially this year online, but for me, you know, <laughs> when I've used my best inner actress all day and at the end of the day, I eat chocolate and watch, you know, murder mysteries with a happy ending. That's what I need to de-escalate. <laughs> but for our students, um, we might want to use, here I have the pictures, you know, uh, the deep breathing and blowing out, you know, there's lots of dandelions this year. I don't know why. Um, in my neighborhood, there's this one dandelion lawn. I thought those people have really given up, you know, but like blowing the dandelion seeds or using the fidget toys, like the picture I have here, you know, with the older students, I let them listen to music. I know we're not supposed to uh, let them use their phones, but I just find with intermediate students, with high school students, the music really helps them calm down quickly. And so if I think they're getting triggered and escalating, I let them listen to music so they can de-escalate for, you know, 10 minutes. I give them a time limit. They listen. It really helps. A lot of times um, the trigger is anxiety. So this is another paradigm shift. There's just a lot of paradigm shifts going on right now in education. 
we were taught, I don't know if you were, but I was taught that when students are not doing what I ask, it's because they're being rebellious because they don't want to do what I ask. And so I should give consequences so that they know the consequence for not doing what I ask so that they can learn that in life, we have to do things we don't like, like report cards or calling all the parents to remind them to sign the permission form. <laughs> However, Recently, we have learned that students often don't do what we ask because they lack the skills to do it. They would like to do it, but they cannot do it. I have to tell you, this has helped me be so much less angry. Like if I think they're just being rebellious and they don't want to do what I ask and it's a power struggle, like inside, I'm angry. That takes a lot of my inner actress, you know, to not be angry. But if I think oh, this is probably anxiety, the anxiety is freezing them up. They're not able to do what I ask. They lack the skills to do what I ask. I am much calmer. And really, I don't even care if it's true or not. It just helps me be calmer in class, and I'm a much calmer and better teacher. And so when we're going to teach them how to be less anxious, find out what's making them anxious and giving them calming activities, that can really help, right? And that's where... Um, you know, the deep breathing, the, um, you know, positive self-talk comes in. I have to say, I find a lot of students have a lot of negative self-talk. I don't want to do this. This is too hard. I can't do it. I hate being online. I miss my friends, right? Like all that negative self-talk goes around and around. And so we practice positive self-talk. I can't do this yet, but I will do it. Right? So talking, so we teach them how do we do an inner dialogue to help us reduce the anxiety, right? So that we can help regulate the emotions. And more than that, we don't just want them to survive. I feel like this year, especially, it's sort of been like, I'm just going to survive the year, <laughs> right? Like at the end of the day, my eyes are tired and oh my goodness, I have to use my reading glasses, which remind me I'm getting old, you know, like just survive. But no, no, we want them to thrive. Like we want them to have friends. We want them to, you know, really figure out how can I be calm and how can I be happy? And even in this difficult time, there's so many like really good things like, I have learned so much more about like online teaching this year. It's great. I am definitely a better teacher. And my students are definitely better students, especially like, they're whizzes online now. And even the ones who are still having difficulty, they're so much better, right? And we want to point out to them like this, this is how we thrive. Like this is how we, you know, we think we're not doing well, but we actually look at all these things that we've learned, right? We want to point out to them, you're doing great. You're doing great. Communication. Um, I remember I had uh, this student and she was uh, deaf and blind and she had an EA who was with her. And the EA taught me so much about communicating with her that year. And her favorite thing to do was she would put something of hers down in the classroom and then I would take her somewhere else in the classroom. Like we would hold hands and we'd go somewhere and then she would lead me back to whatever that thing was that she left using the map in her mind. She loved doing it and it was amazing. She did not bang into anything. And so, um, and so it was just so interesting learning to communicate with her that year or that summer it was a summer program so that summer um and really really fun and i was so glad there was an ea <laughs> and lots of times i really lean on the educational assistance on the uh, special education teacher they can help me a lot so with our autistic students there's some really common things i'm sure you've seen them uh, low tech and high tech the low tech ones are a storyboard um, where there's like, it's a board, often like um, hard cardboard or, and it has pictures on it. And the student will just point to the picture. So um, obviously this usually comes with minimally verbal students. In Ontario, often our autistic students are verbal. However, with the changes in legislation, more and more, we will see more and more um, uh, 
minimally verbal students coming into our mainstream classes, right? And so we want to know how do we teach these minimally verbal students with all of our students, right? And one of the main things is going to be um, communication. And I have to tell you that many students who come into our classroom with hardly any words will leave our classroom with sentences and phrases. Right? And if they come in with sentences and phrases, they will leave our classrooms with communication, like whole conversations. So um, autistic students often, um, the first little bit, they are minimally verbal, minimally verbal, minimally verbal, and then all of a sudden they'll just shoot right up. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're not thinking, oh, they're always going to be minimally verbal. Um, this lady, Temple Grandin, didn't speak until she was three, and now she has two PhDs, right? So. Uh, the communication is really important. So maybe we're going to learn some sign language, like this guy, this high school student, is using sign language on his Zoom meeting, right? So we're going to learn some sign language, and maybe we're going to teach our class some sign language. You know, very simple: yes, no, uh, play, more hungry, uh, toilet, that kind of thing, right? Or we're going to have the storyboard where the student will point to what they want to say, right? Or sometimes it's around a lanyard with all these pictures and you sort of shuffle through the pictures and they point, right? Just don't forget to send the storyboard and the lanyard with the prep teachers, right? The French teacher gets it, the phys ed teacher gets it, <laughs> otherwise they have no way of communicating. <laughs> um, so we want, you know, that's one of the ways that we can do it. Other ways are high tech, right? Sometimes they have an iPad and then there's certain phrases um, programmed into their iPad and they can just touch the phrase and it'll say it out loud in an Aussie accent if you want, in a British accent if you want. Um, I love the Irish accent. I can't understand what they're saying, but it sounds so pretty. So anyway, <laughs> yeah, so we can use low tech and high tech communication tools. Okay, socializing. Um, one of the sort of main traditional characteristics of um, autism is that autistic students have trouble socializing. And so we're really going to help them with this. And this is one of those areas where it really enters into the universal design for learning. Because a lot of our students need help knowing what to do when we're angry at our friends, what to do if our friends speak behind our back, how do we become friends, right? And one of the ways we can help is with social stories. And no, a social story is not about dating, but it could be. A social story shows how to do a task in smaller steps so that our autistic students can learn how to do that task. And it might be how to make a friend, and it might be how to um, uh, calm down. Uh, and here, I just have one right here from YouTube. You can find them all over YouTube on how to put on a seatbelt. So we're going to watch that now. That's step one, open the car door. Step two, sit in the seat. Step three, close the car door. Step four, look behind you for seatbelt. Step five, grab the seatbelt. Step six, find the buckle. Step seven, pull strap across body. Step eight, find the lock. Step nine, put buckle into lock. That was a success. Okay, so we can see, right? It's very, um, very like step by step by step, right? So perhaps a student like um, is on the soccer team and the parents drive them and they don't know how to put on a seatbelt, right? So they watch the social stories over and over and over again and it helps them to uh, learn how to do things that other people seem to be able to do really easily, you know? Um, and for example, like making a friend. How do you make a friend? There's lots of social stories out there. And some of our other students might need this conversation too, right? Maybe you look for a common interest. Maybe you see somebody reading a manga and you like manga. And so you can go over and we teach them to say, I see you're reading a manga. I like mangas too, right? So we're going to teach them like specific steps to do. Or maybe we're going to teach them, you know, if your friend has said something about you you don't like, you wait until you're alone and you say to them, I felt sad when you said, you know, I always play the games only I want to play, right? So 
um, we're going to give them like step by step by step what to do. And we're going to do it a lot because the things that are come sort of more naturally might not come naturally to them or some of the other students in our classes. Right. And another thing we can do is we can read Amelia Bedelia books or Curious George books. Those are two uh, books about people who need things explained step by step by step. Right. It sort of normalizes what we're doing. So I think those are kind of fun. The last thing I want to talk about in preparing uh, in socializing is preparing our students for a job. So if we're working in high school and um, we're helping our students like you know, when their parents decide, will they get a job? Will they go to university? Will they go to college? You know, there's just so many decisions. And even if they're in high school, they may want a part-time job, right? If they're, if they're able to. And so we're gonna help them look at what are they good at? Are they good at doing things online? One of the uh, young guys, young autistic men I interviewed has a job right now that he got because he learned a coding language when he hosted a Minecraft server. And that coding language is what he uses in his job. So many times Temple Grandin says autistic people won't get a job through an interview because they don't interview well. They'll get a job through the back door. Like perhaps they might find a problem a company is having and fix it. Or perhaps they might uh, like working with students and we can introduce them to people who maybe own a tutoring business, right? Like we're gonna help them look for the back door into a job. Okay. Uh, staying safe. So I don't know about you, but when I went to teacher's college, there was no class where they taught us what to do when students were kissing and doing heavy petting during recess. Like that was for sure not a class I took. You know, what do you do when your students are engaging in sexual touching in the classroom? No, nothing. And even if you try like to find out in books, there's not that much written. And for sure, I don't want to look that up online because who knows what's going to pop up on my computer, right? Like, how do we find out what to do when that's happening? I remember I had the staff meeting where they were telling us, how do you handle students making out at recess? <laughs> right? Like it was, I'm like, okay, this is a little bit crazy. Not the kind of staff meeting I thought I was going to be having. But like, these sorts of things happen. You know, there's lots of topics that were not covered in teachers college or even in normal professional development workshops that we really need to talk about. So one of them is students who self-harm, right? So this is becoming more and more of an issue and it's especially an issue with um, autistic girls in high school, especially because they're often diagnosed later um, because they do a lot of uh, masking. So we want to make sure that we know what to do, right? We're going to prevent them from harming themselves. You know, maybe that year we don't use scissors and X-Acto knives in our class, you know. But the thing about students who self-harm is that there's a lot of help. So there's the social worker at the school, and often a board has an autism team. And if you have a student who is self-harming, the autism team will come to your classroom. They come for a couple of days to a couple of weeks. They see what's going on. They get um, a strategy. They work with you in implementing the strategy. And then they come back a month later, two weeks later, to see how it's going. For sure, if you have students who are self-harming, you can get resources from the board. Students who engage in sexual touching. Um, now, I'm a phys ed teacher. I graduated in phys ed. I taught phys ed a lot of my career, and I teach a lot of health, and I love teaching sex ed. It's fun for me, but I understand there's a lot of teachers who it's kind of uncomfortable. So I want to encourage you that the autistic students don't really know often what's normal, um, and they don't understand the social construct that sexual touching is a taboo subject. So they're not going to be embarrassed. So when you talk with them, you want to make sure that you have a teacher who's the same gender as the student, right? So for me, I'm going to take a male teacher with me to talk to one of my male students about sexual touching. Um, and I'm going to let them know that it's inappropriate in class. Just like we wouldn't go to the bathroom in the classroom, we don't engage in sexual touching in the classroom, uh, that that's something that's done in private. And if it's being done with another person, we have that person's permission. 
And I know it's hard to imagine, but it really will become just like anything else that you're trying to get the student to stop doing, right? Like same as picking their nose. We don't pick our nose in the classroom. We don't do sexual touching in the classroom. And we provide, you know, reminders and consequences for it to help them stop. And it's just another, so it'll become a normal thing, you know. So at the beginning, it's a bit difficult. Um, but, you know, talking with the parents can help. It's probably a problem they have, you know, when they go to the movies as well. Well, not nowadays. We're not going to the movies nowadays. But anyway, when things get back to normal. <laughs> so um, in the book, there's a whole section on that topic. The last thing I want to talk about uh, in trying to keep our autistic students safe is autistic burnout. Autistic burnout happens when autistic people try to mask their autism and be more normal. And all the energy they use to try to stop maybe rocking or repeating words over and over again, or they try, they're trying to look you in the eyes, which is very hard, um, it, it makes them tired. And if they do it too much, they're just going to be unable to do work. This happens especially again in high school. So we want to make sure that it's okay for our students to be themselves in our classroom. And so maybe they're making a clicking noise, which annoys the other students. So we have to work out as a class, how do we allow the student to make a clicking noise and not bother the other students. Maybe the other students need noise canceling headphones. Maybe we need to seat them farther away from the people who it really bothers, right? Because we want everyone to be themselves in our classroom. Oh, there's so, so much more, but please, please, here's a list of resources that I really, really like. Um, and again, please, please, please do email me or contact me on any social media or go to the website and get more information. There's just so much more out there. And I have to say, a lot of you already know this, but it is so fun teaching autistic students. You know, like when you get to know them and this one student, she loved watching baking videos. And so when she was done, uh, her work, I would let her watch baking videos, and I got hooked on baking videos, and now I love Chef John at foodwishes.com, um, and his baking videos, I'm like, I'm supposed to be influencing her, and she is 100% influencing me, so I just want to encourage you, it is so, so fun working with autistic students, and I really look forward to talking with you guys more if you would like about that. Wow. Wow was about all I can say at this moment, man. I can't believe you covered that all in uh, in less than an hour. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I have I have to confess, though, as you were talking, there were a few times that my teacher brain kind of kicked in and it almost felt overwhelming. Like, you know, there's so much like the paradigm is changing and there's all these good practices that, you know, I've got to bring to bear in the moment. And you talked at the end about um, about the, the 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 burnout. But what about, I mean, for you, I mean, even this year, there must have been times where it's like you just look, kind of looked up at the ceiling at the end of the day and went, whew, that, that's a lot. Like, I'm assuming that's something that there's also that piece of kind of self-care that you can, you're not going to do it all in one day. I guess I guess that's what I'm asking. Is that a fair way of, of looking at it? Yes. Teachers are being asked to do things we were not trained for. We were not trained, right, to teach yeah. autistic students. We were, you know, that was part of the special education training. And so yeah. it is difficult. Like, we're, like, it's difficult. And so just what you said, you you do one thing one day and you do the same thing the next day, <laughs> you know, you and you try it for a week. And then once that's okay, you add in the next thing. Like, you know, there's only so much we can do. And I, I try to remember this. Good enough is good enough. Like, teachers tend to be perfectionists. That's just not everyone, but many teachers tend to be perfectionists. And I have to keep saying to myself, Amanda, it's good enough. Just stop working, especially this year. This year I worked till seven at night, eight at night, and I never did that. And I just like, you know, it's good enough, Amanda. It's good enough. <laughs> just... 
Yeah, I think that's really that's really good advice. And, uh, yeah. you know, I think and then when you look at it that way, you can take all those sort of different categories and like, OK, I'm going to focus in on, you know, communication yes. this week and then maybe it's social, socialization. It doesn't necessarily have to all be at once. And that's where it sounds like the parents become your ally or you're their ally. I'm not sure which way <laughs> which way that goes. You know, it sounds like it's a it's a pretty important relationship to have during the year. Yeah, you just take, I say, you take the biggest problem. What is the biggest like thing that's happening that's interrupting your teaching? And work on that first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. So, well, I think it's, uh, we're almost near the end. And I, I don't want to forget to, uh, to share out uh, our offer to folks. Um, so I'll just quickly get that up there um, for folks. If uh, there's been lots of uh, thank yous already in the in the chat bar, Amanda, and covering oh, the information you. that you covered on a difficult topic. And so, folks, uh, please feel free. Uh, that little blue button, the Visit Pembroke Publishers, will take you right to Amanda's page. And if you use the call the code uh, WTD for what's the difference twenty one, uh, there is a a discount for purchasing her book as well. So uh, it's uh, it's we encourage you to do that. Uh, it, I, I think I'm, it's fair for me to say that it's an extension of everything that you talked about. And I did hear lesson plans at the, uh, at the end, which uh, is always a, a top seller at any time of the year, even the summertime, Amanda. So, yeah. Um, just I'll let you have the last word and kind of close us out here uh, today. But uh, on behalf of everyone, thank you so much. I know it's also the end of the school year for you. So it's not like uh, this was just something that you just pulled up, pulled up uh, in a moment's notice. So thank you so much for taking the time to walk us through this. But I'll pass uh, I'll pass it back over to you to, to close us off for this evening. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Lionel. I just want to say one more time, thank you for coming. Like, I know some people, actually, this is their last day of school in high school. And thank you so much, guys, for coming during the last week of school and for sitting through a, you know, an hour-long webinar. I'm so, so pleased. And I'm really, really glad that you were able to get things out of it. You're so welcome. And I just, I look forward to speaking. I, there's always people who email later. So I just so look forward to speaking with you again later. Great. Thank you. And thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. We'll see you next time. Take care. Right.